What's up, y'all? I'm Will here with Schedule Fly, and this is the Restaurant Owners Uncorked podcast, one of the highest rated hospitality podcasts in the world, brought to you by us at Schedule Fly. We provide a very simple web based restaurant employee scheduling software backed by legendary customer service. If you're on pencil and paper or Excel, or you're on some software with tons of bells and whistles and features you don't need or use, ScheduleFly is the perfect place for you. Easy to use, point, click, and go, and we'll take great care of you. ScheduleFly.com, free trial, check it out. Also, this podcast is brought to you by our sponsors, Pop Menu and The Giving Kitchen and KickFin. And you're going to hear about them in just a minute. First of all, let's talk about today's guest. Hey, what's up, y'all? This episode is a really interesting episode. This is Sean Josephs, and not only does he own Char Number no. 4 and Maysville in New York, very, very successful restaurants, he's also the co-founder and master blender of Pinhook Bourbon. And we spent like an hour and a half talking, probably you know, half of that about restaurants and hospitality and his story and how he got into it how he became a certified sommelier and then how he got into bourbon and why they, why he, and actually a, a friend of mine, a mutual friend who introduced us, why those two and their, their third co-founder started Pinhook Bourbon and what Pinhook means and how they're associated with thoroughbred horses. And I mean, it's just freaking awesome. This is a cool, cool story. Sean's a sharp dude. He lives in New Orleans and um, I had the chance to meet him and hang out with him once before. We've been talking about a lot of things lately we're trying to help each other, uh, which we didn't really even get into during this conversation. It's really more his story and what's happening in the world of bourbon and hospitality and everything in between. So this is an awesome episode. We had a good time talking. It's a long episode, and you're going to enjoy every bit of it. Thanks for listening. The busiest time of year is coming. Is your staff ready for the holiday rush? This year, give your team the gift of Pop Menu AI Answering, a simple solution for phones ringing off the hook. AI answering handles calls 24-7, 365 days a year, so your staff can focus on in-person guests. Customize your greetings and responses, answer common questions, promote specials and events, and send follow-up links to ordering and reservations. AI answering handles it all while escalating more complex conversations back to your team. Never miss another tasty revenue opportunity. Pop Menu, the marketing technology platform designed to make growing your restaurant easy. Discover more AI restaurant tools that turn your to-do list into an already done list by requesting a demo today. For a limited time, get $100 off your first month, plus lock in one unchanging monthly rate at popmenu.com. Go now to get $100 off your first month at popmenu.com. Be sure to tell them that Will from Restaurant Owners on Court Podcast and Schedule Fly sent you. Y'all, this is a great business. I just told you what they like me to say. I will say that we have a lot of mutual customers at Schedule Fly with Pop Menu. They all agree. Great product, great customer service, great results. Check them out, popmenu.com. This episode is also brought to you by The Giving Kitchen. Giving Kitchen provides emergency assistance for food service workers through financial support and a network of community resources. Since its inception in 2013, Giving Kitchen has served over 15,000 food service workers and awarded over $10.5 million to food service workers in crisis. If you or someone you know is a food service worker in crisis, please ask for help. TheGivingKitchen.org, and again, that's thegivingkitchen.org. Y'all, this is a phenomenal organization. Jen, the founder, has been on this podcast. Jen Heidinger Kendrick, check out that episode to hear their full story. But if you know somebody or you need help, go to thegivingkitchen.org. Incredible, incredible organization and very responsive and has a wonderful mission. Check them out. Wow, this is cool. Uh, I wish this would be a lot cooler if it, if it had happened like it was supposed to today. So I was supposed to be down in New Orleans today, y'all, and um, was going to be able to hang out with Sean Josephs in person, but family life uh, got, you know, happens. And uh, so luckily, we have this cool studio that we can record from, and Sean's there in New Orleans, and I'm back here or staying here in Charlotte, and uh, 
we get to do it over Zoom. So, uh, Sean, what's up, man? Introduce yourself. Hey, how's it going? Um, my name's Sean Josephs. I am the founder and master blunder for Pinhook Bourbon. Um, been in that role for, I guess we're coming up on 10 years since we founded the company, um, which is crazy to me. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, just, it's been an amazing journey because um, we started by just buying 20 barrels um, with your buddy, Charles Holford, uh, and another friend and uh, that cost nine grand because back in 2011 when we bought the barrels it was 465 bucks a barrel for a three-year-old bourbon um for anyone who knows the market it's a lot more than that now um so it's kind of one of those perfect amazing things of where you just get together with a couple friends and say hey wouldn't it be cool if we had our own bourbon i think we could put our heads together and do something unique and, and something that hasn't been done before um and here we are i mean we're we're still a small company but you know last year we dumped 1200 barrels so definitely more than mm. 20 so it's been some good some good growth um but you'll appreciate this um i should say you'll appreciate this knowing charles the craziest thing to me about pinhook is that it started as one of those slightly drunken conversations where you're like you know what we should do that would be really awesome and it's like and we all know how many of those actually go anywhere Um, like less than one half of one percent right (laughs) well yeah the reality hits the next day yeah and most of them too are even simpler things like we should go cross-country skiing tomorrow or we should go bowling tomorrow like most of them aren't even that aspirational you just feeling in good spirits and you're like you make some sort of plan uh even yeah. a modest plan and it still never happens all right dude we got a lot of a lot to unpack here so before we even got to that conversation um that y'all had uh how did you get started initially how and when in hospitality you've had a really interesting career yeah so like most good things it started with my better half um she opened a Spanish tapas bar in Manhattan uh, called Tia Paul, which opened in the summer of 2004. Okay. And what were you, what were you doing prior to that? I was working in kind of branding and design agencies and I was an account manager and I okay. absolutely hated it. Yeah. And it was just one of those things where, you know, go to college, graduate from college, lived in Japan for a year, traveled Southeast Asia, came back, lived in Telluride, Colorado for two years, working for the ski mountain, working for the golf course. And then at some point, you know, I was, and honestly was not getting any pressure from family, but I was just like, you know, like I already saw what Telluride was. I was like, I should at least try to get some sort of job. Mm. And I just, as those types of things go. It was just, it was a pure entry level job. I mean, I didn't really have any skills. I mean, I was a college graduate and I'd worked at the mid mountain lodge and sold lift tickets and worked in a retail shop, but like, I didn't have any like <laughs> real skills. I mean, Where did you go to college? I went to Colgate university for one year. Then I transferred to Colorado college in Colorado Springs. Okay. How did you know? See, I want to say Chiba. I'll say Charles. You we call him Chiba. Chiba. That's good. Wait, you went so, to, did you know him when you were, you went to staff? No, and, I mean, no. we would have okay. played him, you know, we would have played Woodbury Forest, but I did not know him in yeah. those days. Yeah, that came later. Okay. Um, so anyway, I just, it's like, it's, I don't know. I mean, I know this has happened to other people. All of a sudden you have this career. Like mm. I became sort of pigeonholed in a specific role of being an account manager. And I just, again, pure randomness, most of the brands that I was working with were fashion and beauty. And I have zero interest in either of those two things. And sometimes I would, I would wake up and go to work and I'd be like, I used to like ski to work. Like now I'm in a meeting and I'm not exaggerating talking about this season's lipstick colors. And I'm just (laughs) Were you in Manhattan at this point? In Manhattan. You moved to New York? Yeah. Yeah, Okay. Because that was just where my one, like through you know, through my dad, it was, 
a friend of a friend essentially who had just started by opening an agency and I didn't know enough to say and it was just like a job that paid twenty four thousand dollars a year and it was the job that I got you know yeah and it's funny right you don't know when you I'm sure it happens to a lot of people you wake up one day and you're like I honestly have no idea why I'm doing this I never had any interest in doing this it just sort of happened to me yeah you feel like I mean it's not true right I mean it's like you have control but I felt like I was just like, it's just the way the chips fell. Like, these are the circumstances. Now I'm an account manager living in New York City, specializing in fashion and beauty. And I don't even understand what I'm doing. Yeah. I just don't like it. And I have no no idea what else to do. Went down the same path, um, man. Yep. I got you. Yeah. Sure. So really the most fortuitous thing was my, well, it was fortuitous ultimately but at the time it was pretty scary my wife opened her restaurant in july july 28th of 2004 and then i got fired i say fired because let go sounds soft like i was fired i mean i there was, it wasn't like some big thing happened but i i lost my job and uh at the the agency i was working at at the time so in a, in a way that was a huge um i mean it was great in the sense that i was like oh good I don't have to do this job anymore, but I had no idea what, to, what I was going to do. And so I ended up for not knowing what else to do, running food at my wife's restaurant. And so for anyone listening, who's never worked in a restaurant, I mean, being a food runner is exactly like it sounds. It's really the step after dishwasher. Um, you know, you literally just take the food from the kitchen to the table it's supposed to go to and hopefully bring it to the right person. If there are seat numbers. Um, and that's it. You just like run around and roll silverware and carry bus tubs down to the dishwasher and run more food and clear bus tables. And, you know, you're just running around. Um, but as someone who grew up playing a lot of sports, to me, it was the closest thing to like, it's like a team sport. There's a lot of camaraderie. Mm. It's really physical. I mean, you're just yep. on your feet. Like you're just moving. It's a lot of hustling. movement. You're hustling around. Yep. Yeah. And I loved it. I absolutely that was for me, that was my, my moment where I was like, oh, I've found my, my calling. Like this is, this is for me. And I didn't even really, at that time, I didn't really understand. I didn't know enough about it to know, like in what capacity I was just maybe feeling this is the first time I've done something that is considered to be work that I really, I know it's such a cliche, but that I, I did think it was fun. Well, look, I mean, that's where a lot of people I can't, I mean, again, over 500 episodes, there's like 95% of the people I've, I've had on this podcast. That's where it started. It was some 14 year old got a job washing dishes or eight yeah. or needed or got a job during college to make it, it but you, there's a certain number of people that have this wiring where you don't want to be in an office. You don't mm -hmm. want to sit still. You yep. like the commotion and the energy and, and yep. even the, the stress that comes with it because you feel like at the end of the night you've accomplished something cool and you made people smile and the whole team kind of did something great or yeah. you, you messed something messed up that night, but you learn and you get better and tons of camaraderie, tons of, I mean, in good restaurants, good communication, good teamwork, good, good, like oh, getting yeah. each other's backs. And, and then you I mean, also learn like how to keep your cool amidst the storm, which is a really valuable skill set no matter Absolutely. what you do right i mean the other thing too is for anyone who's worked like a i mean actually i think even if you worked in restaurants and you didn't like it you'd have to acknowledge that time flies you're busy i mean if i mean i guess the only time the only time restaurants can be feel dull is if you're working a shift that's literally it's like nobody comes and you're just standing around but generally speaking, if you're working in a restaurant and it's moderately busy, you're just going to run your ass off for, you know, eight, eight hours. You're just going to run. And then it's like, you'll never have that feeling of like you do when you're sitting at your desk. It's like, yeah, there's no desk job you can do where eight hours passes as quickly as a restaurant. It's not, no, not even close. No, not possible. And it's just like, I mean, I think even now too, right. We know so much about how important exercise is. And, you know, it's like you're on your feet, you're moving. And sometimes you're yeah. like, you are physically running, you're just up and down the stairs. And, you know, it's like, eventually when I started working in bigger restaurants, 
and I became a sommelier. I'm jumping ahead, but like I would put on a pedometer and I would easily do 10 miles, you know, mm, in a day. Yeah. Easy. Just hustling. Yeah. Yeah. What, okay. So, all right. So your wife opens a restaurant in Manhattan. So she yeah. obviously had a lot of experience in that. It, is that restaurant still there or what happened with still it? Still there. Yeah. Still there. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Coming up on, yeah. So I mean, 19 years old will be 20 years this fall or this summer. So, or not, y'all, sorry, not you this live summer, in summer of next year. But you live in New Orleans now. Do y'all still have that? Yeah. So her, her founding partner still lives in, in New York and the way they've kind of divvied up the workload. Um, I mean, my wife is great on the floor, but, you know, it has ended up taking on more of the sort of back office operational things from that standpoint. Um, so she goes to New York once a month, um, you know, and then is just able to work remotely outside of that. What's it called? It's called Tia Paul. It's two words, T-I-A and then P-O-L. Um, okay. Yeah, it's a cool spot. I mean, they were... I mean, now it's quite different, but when they opened, they were kind of cutting edge of Spanish food. Not, not, I mean, it's a lot of classic Spanish dishes, but so much of what was available in New York through the lens of Spain was just like the guys with the cummerbunds and the sangria with the wooden spoon. And, you know, yeah, right. she, my wife had lived in Madrid for several years. And so it was really, it was really more of what you would have seen in Spain in terms of the approach. And so... But at the time, that made it super unique mm. in not just New York, but in the United States. Um, so they had, you know, besides the fact that they've been open for 19 years, they were incredibly successful in a, in a way that's probably hard to describe now because there was no social media and there was no Yelp. Yeah. So it was really just you were only you could only really be written up in these larger publications and um you know, get into Time Out New York, New York Magazine, New York Times, obviously. And, you know, then there was like a couple food blogs. Like it's just, right now we kind of take it for granted that like if a new restaurant opens, you're just going to hear about it 7 million different ways through your, mostly through your Instagram feed. Yeah. Uh, but back then you, you actually had to build it. Uh, not trying to wax nostalgic. It's just the fact like it was a different time. Like you just had to work it through just repeat guests and word of mouth and, whatever, if you were lucky enough to be in the print, you know, press them, you know. Does she, uh, where in, where in Manhattan is it? It's 10th Avenue and 22nd street. And they've been at the same location the entire time. Okay. Is that like lower? It's, it's called, it's called West Chelsea. Okay. And it's small too. They eventually added like a back room that they can use for sort of family style a la carte dining, but is also for events, but probably between, the main restaurant itself is 42 seats, including the bar. And now it's only like you'd call it 60 seats, including the back room. But it's a very small, just like a little sliver of a restaurant. So well, pretty cool. I'm asking because I'm going up to New York next month. Oh, you got to so check it out. Yeah. I want to go hang out there. Oh, yeah. yeah. That would be amazing. We'd love we'll, we'll set you up there for sure. I might try to pitch him some scheduling software. We'll see. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Absolutely, so, okay. you better. <laughs> so you were okay. So you're there doing that, and then, um, and then you went from that to what happened next? Because you, I mean, that's a big jump running food to getting a master sommelier. That's yeah. I so, I mean, I don't say this. I mean, now I can laugh about it, but I would say like that experience almost cost us our marriage because. You know, I was, it's, I mean, it was, you know, we didn't have any experience in restaurants. My wife had worked in restaurants, but had never managed one. And so being in the tip pool in your wife's restaurant and like, I was like, this is great. I'm having a great time. And she's like, this is miserable. <laughs> um, and it was also a pretty big disconnect. I mean, they're, they were getting tons of great press and their picture, her and her partner, their pictures in the New York times and all these things are happening for them. And I'm just you know, and then just all the stress of, of owning and operating a busy, you know, successful restaurant in New York and all of the challenges that come with that. And, and I'm just like running around like a little food runner being like, this is so much fun. This is great. <laughs> Shut up. Um, so, I mean, fortunately, our marriage survived. 
Um, but part of the reason is I realized I should not be working there or maybe she told me I couldn't work there. It's the same difference. Um, but anyway, because I had really decided that that was going to be my life's work. Like I was like, this is it for me. The thing that made the most sense to me, and I don't know, in hindsight, I don't know if I was right or wrong, but it worked out for me was I felt like I needed to see restaurants at what I would say was the highest level. Cause mm -hmm. I felt like I just wanted to see it, you know, it's, Tia Paul, again, it's just casual tapas, food comes as it comes, um, very yeah. inexpensive. And I really wanted to see it, you know, maybe the opposite end of the spectrum. So I went to work at a restaurant called Chanterelle, uh, which was in Tribeca. It closed in 2008, but they were open for 30 years. And when they mm. initially opened, it was a French restaurant. And when they opened, it was super cutting edge because they were in Tribeca when there was nothing there. Like yeah. it was still sketchy. And here they were opening this um, kind of modern French restaurant, although very driven by classics. Um, and they were, by the time I was working there, it had been demoted one time, one star to three stars from the New York Times, but it was a four star restaurant. So at one point it was one of, you know, four or five four star restaurants in New York. And so, they hired me even though other than Tia Paul, I had no restaurant experience. And to be honest, like the experience I had there wasn't super helpful because it was a true fine dining restaurant with classic French service. Um, yeah. And I was totally out of my depth and was pretty terrified working there, I would say, because it was all... Um, it's nothing I'd ever seen before, you know, just even like, this is a sauce spoon, you know, it's just right. like the way that service went. Yeah. Um, and the amount of money people were spending and all that type of stuff. And so the first thing I learned among many things pretty quickly was that if you don't know about wine in that setting, you're pretty useless. Yeah. Right. Like it's, it's kind of embarrassing when someone's like, Hey, what do you think? I was thinking about the Sauvignon Blanc or the Viognier with the sea bass. And you're just like, I have no idea. Like, Sounds good. <laughs> don't know what either of those are. I don't, I don't even, I don't know. So, um, so I, I decided that I was going to learn as much about wine as I could. Yeah. Um, it just seemed like the natural progression because it became clear to me that if you want people to take you seriously or you want to have any success in that environment, you have to be wine knowledgeable, which doesn't necessarily mean becoming a sommelier, but it does mean having a really good foundation of, of wine knowledge. And the sommelier there, Roger Legorn is a master sommelier. And he took me under his wing, which isn't because I showed any special talent. It's basically surprisingly, there aren't that many people even in an environment like that who are super into wine. Um, probably in a way, I don't know if in a way that maybe, I don't know if New York restaurants are still like this, but really pretty much everyone I worked with was a would be actor mm. or writer. So they yeah. really were about it. Like the flexibility, you make good money, you go to your auditions. Yeah. Um, so there weren't that many, there was, I would say there were career waiters there, but they were only career waiters because they never got their break. Right. They, Not they, because they were dedicated to the craft right they had not come there to be career raiders but yeah and and being that exactly and they weren't like well now that i'm here and i've been here this long i should become a wine expert i mean they all knew enough to be able to you know they always had a few wines that they knew or felt comfortable with just to kind of recommend to people um so anyway i roger de gorn suggested that i get my sommelier certificate from the American sommelier, sommelier association, which I did. Uh, it was a crap ton of work. I mean, I think a lot of the people had worked in restaurants and knew more than I did. So I just kind of had to, in essence, learn about the entire world of wine, like all the, all the countries. <laughs> it was a lot. I, I think fortunately, like one area where I'm lucky, I just have a good memory, you know? So a lot of it is, Everyone thinks of wine like tasting, which is important, but in order to understand wine, you have to jam just a lot out of what they would call wine theory into your head. You're like, what are the 20 major wine regions in Italy? 
and then okay within each of those 20 major regions what are the subregions within each okay in each subregion what grapes are allowed what alcohol percentages are required what aging is required what is the soil type what is this, this what is this, that what's the history of the region and so on and so forth and then you just multiply and that's just italy granted it's a big one and then you're like now you need to learn all of france and you need to learn all of spain and you need to learn all of america and and south africa and new zealand and south america and so on and so forth so um it's an endeavor, you know, um, but I had the good fortune of, I was committed to it. Like I was just determined and that's all I was doing. Like I was working at restaurants, you're around wine all day. You go to your tasting groups, you go to your classes, you memorize stuff about wine and you're just, it's like full immersion. And so. How long is that? I was just in is it. that like a six month process, a year process? Yeah, it took me. So I never, by the way, you said master sommelier. I never became a master sommelier. There's an organization called the Court of Master Sommeliers. And I did the first two levels. The second level I passed is what made me a certified sommelier through the court. Okay. Certified uh, sommelier. Okay. It took, I mean, I guess I went in two years, I went from literally not knowing anything about wine to having a job as a sommelier at a very large, successful restaurant in New York City. Okay, okay. But I think it probably, I'm not saying like I'm special. I just think I, I have pretty high tolerance for pain. Um, I would like get home at one in the morning and study my flashcards till four in the morning and yeah. then go to sleep for four hours and then wake up and go take a wine test and then go work a double at a restaurant and then come and come home late and study more flashcards. Like, so I packed a lot in, um, and I was around yeah. a lot of talented people who also were really serious as well. So it just became, you're just around it every day. You're in the restaurant six days a week and people are constantly opening wine. You're asking questions about wine. You're tasting the wine that you're opening. You're going to a wine yeah. class. You're tasting more wine. You're studying your flashcards. You're meeting up with your friends in your blind tasting group. You're tasting more wine. And you're just, it's like, you it's like I said, it was just true immersion. Mm. Yeah. I think you still have a high tolerance for pain, man. You're a busy dude. You hustle. Yeah, I have a, um, that's a good, hey, if you're doing what you do, that's that's important. That makes a difference. Well, then, so you're doing this. This has got to be getting closer to when y'all started having this this uh, bourbon conversation. Yeah, I know. So I think your podcast's not long enough because I did have some, but I did have some other steps. So the, the next step was, so I went to, from Chanterelle to a restaurant called Per Se. Per Se ah, okay. was... Uh, you know, at the time, whatever, it was ranked the eighth best restaurant in the world, a four-star restaurant. Yeah. I was just trying yeah, to then take it like to the next level. Yeah. And then I ended up getting a job yeah. to be assimilated at a restaurant called Blue Water Grill, which in Union Square, 16th in Union Square West, very more casual restaurant, but great wine list, did $20 million in revenue a year. Like it was a big, busy restaurant. And I really learned a ton there. Um, somewhere in all of this, and I can't pinpoint, it's hard for me to like say what was the moment. I, although I think part of it was actually becoming a sommelier when I actually had the job, it gave me a better understanding of what the future of that job would be. And to me, it was a little boring, you know, just like, yeah, like once you've, I mean, again, maybe I get bored too easily. But I don't know. It's like once you've tasted all the wines, like people are ordering like, oh, great. We're tasting 1961 Petrus and we're tasting 1970 Margot and we're tasting 19 whatever Cheval Blanc. And like you've, and they're delicious, I'm not saying they're not, but you've tasted all the wines and you've dealt with celebrities and challenging tables and you've like done all these things. You can kind of, not that it would ever become an easy job, but you're kind of like, oh, so I'm just going to spend the rest of my life, you know, being in charge of a wine list where I decide what wine goes on the list, training the staff, and then being on the floor and like taking care of the guests. Yeah, you, you, like, you kind of, 
you're up a steep, steep, steep learning curve for a while, and then yeah. you get to a point where you're kind of going to plateau with what happens, unless you go start a winery. I don't know. Yes. Like, yeah, seems you like could that would have been the next. Like, exactly. But it's also, right. I, I think at that point, you, I mean, there are always bigger jobs. Like, you could be like, I'm the person that yeah. oversees this giant restaurant group, and they're 50 you know, no restaurants in the group, and then you're overseeing 25 sommelier. Like, you could always, but then it would just become like a version of management. Right? You're back in corporate America at that point. Yeah. Pretty much. Um, yeah. So, what ended up happening was, and I think in no small part to, I mean, I think we're, we're lucky. Tia Paul was lucky in so many different ways, but I think we're also lucky in that the restaurant was incredibly successful which obviously isn't always the case. So it gave both my wife and myself, not the idea that it was easy, but just that it's, it's doable, right? Like yeah. you can open a restaurant and it, it can make money and, and, and be successful. And so I really, um, I felt like that was the next step for me it was opening my own restaurant. And I think part of that too, right. is like, I was talking mostly about the wine, but like we were just obsessed with restaurants with the cult, you know, and you're like checking every new restaurant that opens and yeah, eventually, so at least for me, I became pretty enamored with this idea of, well, what would my restaurant be? Yeah, like it's, right. you know, it's like a conversation. It's like every, you know, cause you talk to so many hospitality people, it's like you could give 10 different restaurant tours, the exact same concept. And it really would get executed 10 different ways like it's mm -hmm. it's a pretty it's it is an expression of creativity and your own philosophy and point of view sure right? absolutely um, yeah and that's what's super fun about it and so um i just got really set on this idea of like i want to do my thing whatever that looks like um and there are two factors in how it turned out one was, and this is also like very good fortune. My wife's business partner owned the building that Tia Paul's in, and he had another building in Brooklyn, in Cobble Hill. And, you know, he and I had become good friends, and he knew that I now had like worked in these restaurants. And, you know, he had partnered with his wife in one restaurant, my wife in another restaurant, and he wanted to do a third restaurant. And he asked me if I would open a restaurant um, at this location. And so this was the other kind of ser moment of serendipity. He's the one who really got me into bourbon. So he'd been mm. a bourbon collector way before people were collecting bourbon. Like he was collecting bourbon in 2002. I know from being in this space that most people got into collecting bourbon in like 2013. Or people are like, mm. yeah, I've been into it for a while. I started collecting bourbon in 2017. The, you know, this guy was doing it in, in early 2000. Yeah. And so while I was developing my palate around wine, he was like constantly tasting bourbon. So every time I would hang out with him, he's like, try this one, try this one, try this one. And, you know, when you're used to tasting things, not just as a casual taster, but as someone who tastes things for a living, I was pretty intrigued by how high quality the bourbon was. Like I just got really enamored with it. I loved it. And he also made, he had amassed this collection that had become unwieldy. And so his only stipulation was that we incorporate this collection into the restaurant. And he was even saying like, you can open a French bistro for all I care, you know, but we're, so somewhere or another, we're like folding all these bottles in because they're taking up too much room in my house and like it's gotten absurd. And so I'm pretty sure I'll have to ask my wife, but I think she gets credit for this too. I remember kind of thinking that I should lean more into the wine thing and then the bourbon would be secondary. And she was pretty convinced that we really needed to lean into the bourbon piece and make it kind of central to what the restaurant was all about she's from new orleans which is where we live now and so i had also spent a lot of time in new orleans and got really into um just the food culture here and obviously the cocktails and everything that new orleans is all about and so the end result was this restaurant that we opened in 
the fall of 2008 called char number four, which is named after the highest level of char tip that you typically find in a bourbon barrel. And it was essentially a wine bar with bourbon in the place of wine, right? So it was an encyclopedic gotcha. selection of every American whiskey that it was available. I think at the time it was really one of the largest collections of American whiskey anywhere, you know, at a, a bar or a restaurant. And um, I can say this like more as a point of fact than a brag, like we knocked it out of the park. Like we, I had an amazing chef who'd worked for Daniel Belude for 10 years, who was from Texas. He was tired of fine dining. He really wanted to do all this casual food, but with the technique of someone who knew how to make really great food and just the combination of this sort of was kind of like a menu of the smoked, grilled, and charred flavors that go well with bourbon. But I guess you'd say it was like comfort food at a really high level, homemade bacon, homemade sausage, homemade lamb pastrami, mm. half a smoked mm -hmm. chicken, you know. Um, it was very creative without being fussy. And it was very, um, it's just the execution level was incredibly high. So we were named by New York Magazine, one of the 10 best restaurants to open in New York that year. And we were the only restaurant in Brooklyn. So this is also before Brooklyn had kind of before become Brooklyn. this whole, What year was this? This is 08. 08, okay. Yeah. yeah. And we were, um, GQ named us one of the three best places to drink bourbon in America. Although as I always like to say, there were five places to drink bourbon, so it was like not a huge accomplishment. But it, you know, we were really there. <laughs> yeah. At the beginning, like we were there before it blew up. And, yeah, you know, we were Esquire 50 best bars in America. I mean, we had no PR agency. And I think if you were to look at it now, it's like we got every awesome bit of press from every major publication that you could ever hope for. Yeah, that's um, incredible. And it was and I think the, that it was both food as well. But we were the only ones doing this like huge bourbon collection focus, really. I mean, there were like a couple places in Kentucky. And even yeah. back then in Kentucky, you didn't really have places with these massive bourbon collections. So it was like, it's hard to remember because now it feels like this big thing, but it really wasn't that long ago that, you know, it wasn't normal even in Kentucky to be like, oh, look, they have 150 different bourbons, let alone 75. Like it was pretty. No, there, you're right about that. I remember, um, uh, it may have been 2010 ish but uh i don't think well i don't know if you ever ended up meeting dave and dana query i mean i know y'all talked but from big red f out there in boulder yeah, but he had yeah. they had a place he sold it i don't know eight or ten years ago it's called the bitter bar he has yeah. some big bourbon collect I mean, he's from kentucky um yes. and so that's that was sort of his but there i remember thinking at the time i'm like wait a minute you have a, like why why do you have all these bird like Really? You have all these yeah. bourbons? Like it was so weird and unique back then. Um, yeah, you were well. Good timing for that too. Two thousand eight, right after it was. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so I mean, right. like, like we we opened three weeks before Lehman Brothers collapsed. Like we were oh, so yeah. it was also scary. But then I guess we were everything was super affordable. Like the menu was affordable, yeah. and yeah. I think I can't prove this but I'd certainly never seen it. I think we were the first people to offer because I mean, there weren't even that many bourbon bars. Everything was available as a one ounce taste or a two ounce pour. Okay. And there weren't really any expensive bourbons back then. So there were t like, if you were to, I, I wish I, I could probably find a copy of that menu, but there were a lot of bourbons on our list that cost between two and $4 for a one ounce pour. For a pour. So at a time where it was, you know, people were feeling like the it was tight, you could go in there and like try five different bourbons and spend fourteen dollars, you know. So it was it wow. ended up yeah. being good timing, I think. Yeah, affordable food and people needed to drink then. It was a tough time. So that's that works out well. Yeah. But it sounds like y'all just knocked it out of the park with every aspect. Is it um was was it just American? Whiskey yeah, so it's, it's, it's a good question. So what we did was, I actually remember thinking, I have no idea if this is going to work. Like, I don't know if anyone's, because I didn't know the whole bourbon collectors. And I just did, other than my friend that I opened yeah, the restaurant with, right. I didn't know anyone who was really into bourbon. So 
we were kind of questioning, like, I don't know if there's an audience for this. So, you know, I built a really nice wine list and we had whiskeys from around the world. We, you know, there was vodka, gin, rum, tequila in the well. And we had, you know, scotch and Irish and Canadian and Japanese whiskey and all that type of stuff you know good selection of beer so we were sort of like hey well the worst case scenario is no one's really interested in all this bourbon um and then they can just you know have a martini and order a bottle of wine it's fine um but but the thing that we did though is all the other whiskeys were in drawers and all of the other liquors were in the well so the only thing you Mm. can see though it was american whiskey when you walked in american whiskey it's just a big display behind the bar and the cocktails were all only american whiskey cocktails gotcha gotcha so we really leaned we leaned into it into the terms of the design we leaned into it in terms of the menu uh and the name of the restaurant and so it was really centered around american whiskey and i think we felt like we'd be able to pivot if we had to but fortunately that wasn't the case Really, before I started the podcast and started realizing how ridiculously hard it is to successfully start and own and run a, a independent restaurant, oh, it's hard. Yeah, I used to think like I was like, I want to own a restaurant one day. Wes and I would talk about this. Wes is uh, one of the partners here, and um, I was like, he was he was into he used to drink Knob Creek back in the day. He really liked whiskey a lot, and I liked um, I've always liked ribs. I yeah. was like. We're gonna name this. We're gonna name our place. We're gonna start one together. And we're gonna call it Ribs and Whiskey after the widespread panic song. And we're just gonna serve like really good ribs and meat, and a bunch of whiskey. But <laughs> it wasn't that many episodes in where I was like, "Dude, I'm not opening a freaking restaurant." But I like talking to people that do because it's pretty impressive to be able to do that. I, I really do believe that. I think it's incredibly. It's way, 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 way harder than most people think. Most people are like, "Oh, I know a lot about cooking, or I can cook good steak, or I could open a steak place." Like. <laughs> That's that's just, you know, that's the classic, like, re- reason a lot of places don't make it. It's like, who, who cares? I mean, sorry, but if you can cook, that's great. But, you know, opening and running a successful restaurant, bakery, coffee, whatever it is, it's freaking hard. It really I is. Think that, I think that the, it's the two things, right? One is, well, one, obviously, operations. Typically, it's way harder than anyone thinks. But that's one mm-hmm. thing. Like, that's surmountable. Right. I mean, you can figure yeah. it out and it'll never be easy. That's just the reality. But the other piece that I think people discount, and it's probably also, it's probably because it's the part that's a, the guesswork and you have to get lucky is a good restaurant is, is like capturing lightning in a bottle. Like there's something, I think we all know those places and it could be, it could be a dive bar and it could be a diner and it could be a fine dining restaurant and anything in between. But the places that are magic, it's all of it. It's it's the location they picked. It's the way the building sits on the block. It's the design. It's the name. It's the way service is executed. I mean, having good food and good drinks and even a good design is not nearly enough. Like it somehow has to capture something special. Um, and it has to capture, it has to make an emotional connection with people. And there are very successful restaurateurs who have proven time and time again that they can do it. And even those people have duds, which really just shows how much there's a little bit of, I mean, there's a skill and the more skilled you are, the better your chances are of succeeding. But even those people just somehow make the wrong call. All right, y'all, it is time for a little mid-episode break. We're going to talk about KickFin. Thousands of restaurants, bars, and breweries use KickFin to tip out their employees instantly. No cash required. With KickFin, tips go directly to your employees' bank of choice the second their shift ends. It's a really simple solution to a really big problem because if you're still paying out credit card tips in cash, it's costing you. Time-consuming bank runs and cash counting take managers away from work that matters. Cash is hard to track, which leads to accounting headaches, and it creates the perfect opportunity for theft, human error, and compliance issues. Bottom line, there's never been an instant secure way to pay out tips until KickFin. It's an easy-to-use software that sends real-time, cashless tip payouts straight to your employees' bank accounts, 24-7, 365. 
KickFin gives managers hours back in their day, makes reporting a breeze, and protects your business from risk. Most importantly, employees love it. Restaurants can have KickFin up and running overnight. Employees can enroll in seconds. No hardware, no contracts, no setup fees. Visit kickfin.com for a personalized demo. See how restaurants across the country are digitizing tips with KickFin. All right, that's what they asked me to say, so I say it, and it tells the story very well, but I like to add this in. We referred a customer that we know and love very well, Sup Dogs, to KickFin. Sup Dogs has been a customer for a super long time. Trust them very much with their opinion on these types of tools. They started using KickFin. I asked Brett, the owner, recently how it's going. He said, KickFin is perfect. It's going great. Exactly what we were hoping for. So there you go. KickFin.com, y'all. Check them out. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, Charlie Munger passed away recently. I know he was like, I was reading some of his stuff, and he was just talking about how anybody anybody that's had success in business, sustained success and done a lot. Mm -hmm. Like if they don't attribute any of it to luck, they're either you know yeah. naive or or they're lying to you know one of the both. I mean, it's just true. There's there's luck involved, but there's also learning from those duds. And I mean, I think every just about every owner I know that's been at it a long time that's had multiple restaurants has had one that you know didn't work for whatever reason. Yeah. But the best well, ones be learn learn figure out why and they learn from that and they get better you know from that. Yeah, and I had so subsequent to chart number four i opened another restaurant in manhattan called maysville um named after the port town on the ohio river where you know some think that's where bourbon was born uh, because maysville was in old bourbon county and it was the first uh -huh. place that barrels were shipped out of kentucky down the ohio river to new orleans and okay. so it's speculated that maybe the barrels said Old Bourbon whiskey on them because it was from Old Bourbon County. Again, no one can prove it, but it has a place in the history of bourbon. So that's why we called it Maysville. I opened that restaurant with a different chef, a guy named Kyle Nall, who um, who had worked at Gramercy Tavern, which is another you know great you know, yeah. restaurant. And you know the short story is we had another huge success. We got a glowing star glowing two-star review from pete wells who's the, still the food critic for the new york times and again we you know because that was 2012 which is i think to me more when things were really starting to blow up with bourbon mm -hmm. and now we were in manhattan and we were close to all the financial stuff and all the advertising and like um, publishing houses and so we were just packed and you know getting accolades for the food and it was really like Char number four, but, you know, bigger bar, bigger wall of whiskey, you know, and even in that four years, there was a lot more whiskey out there because of, as it became more popular, you're just seeing more craft distilleries, so on and so forth. Um, and the last restaurant I opened was called Kenton's with the same chef in New Orleans, which we opened in 2015. And that one we got named by, um, New Orleans Magazine, best new restaurant in New Orleans. Uh, and the local food critic here, Brett Anderson, who's like the big food critic, gave us an incredible review. Um, but anyway, not to get sidetracked, that that um, that that one didn't do as well. It did really great the first year. And I think my wife and I, who um, did that one more together, even though she's from here, I think we kind of learned that we didn't understand some things about the market, both in terms of perception of guests and then just how small the local market is relative to the tourist market. And then mm. what does it take in terms of name recognition or brand recognition to be able to pull, you get 20 million tourists, but if you're not, you know, they have so many restaurants to go to. And if they're here right. to go to have gumbo and po boys and, you know, go to Antoine's and Arnold's and Galatoire's and all these classic places, why did they want to come to what ostensibly is kind of a more, again, it wasn't fussy, but what would feel like more of a modern Southern restaurant. And then you're not yeah. a name, you're not Donald Link or one of these revered chefs who are from here. So why is anyone going to choose you? And then if you're just duking it out from a local standpoint, there's just not enough to go around. Like you need to be able to pull uh, yeah. enough tourism. So anyway, I could, I could, we could spend two hours just on the postmortem of a failed restaurant, but, um, 
that was the third. So we ended up opening those three restaurants. Um, but in going back to where we started in 2010, um, Charles, I met Charles, I guess I met Charles in like 2008. He is good friends with our other co-founder, Jay Peterson, and Jay and his wife, Alice, and Alice is now the CEO of Pinhook, lived a block away from Tia Paul and were super regulars at Tia Paul. So that's how I got uh-huh. to know Jay and Alice and in turn, how I got to know Charles, who I think the first time I met him, he came in with Jay to chart number four. And that friendship just led to, you know, having dinner and really just having this conversation, as I said at the beginning, it's like, hey, I like we all love bourbon. We had very Jay had gotten married in Kentucky. Charles is just a bourbon enthusiast and also a creative director and designer. I had the restaurant background, you know, centered around both wine and bourbon. Jay had all this experience and love of Kentucky and also a business school guy. So it seemed like a good, you know, we had three unique things to bring to it. And so we bought these barrels, you know, these 20 barrels for nine grand back in, in 2011. So we kind of conceived of the company in 2010 and we we're like, hey, we're going to do this. And by 2011, after poking around, we were finally able to get our hands on some barrels and shipped them to, they were barrels from a distillery in Indiana and we shipped them to Bardstown, Kentucky. And then really just started going to Kentucky four or five times a year to just hang out and just soak it all up because, you know, bourbon can be made anywhere in the United States, but most of the people I meet think that it can only be made in Kentucky. And yeah, let's take a let's take a okay. So because t- this is, I always thought that too, like that it had to be. But there's like specific criteria for it to be bourbon. It doesn't have to yeah. be Kentucky. What are the criteria for it to be? So bourbon? made in America. Yeah. And the Kentucky piece, honestly, is just because for a long period of time, ninety five percent of the production was in Kentucky. Was it Kentucky? So yeah. most bottles that people saw said like Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey on it, like that. So. Yeah. It, that was pretty, really what drove it. Um, and Kentucky does a good job marketing why they have such a special, you know, climate and water and all of this. So, um, so made in America, only three ingredients, water, grain, and yeast, which is important because other, other whiskeys are actually allowed to have other additives. It could be caramel coloring. It could be any number of things you might add to the whiskey, but bourbon is pretty pure in that way. It's just the two ingredients. It has to be aged in a new charred oak barrel. Probably the single, easily the single biggest thing that distinguishes it from any other whiskey in the world is that it can't be a new toasted barrel. It can't be a used char barrel. It has to be a brand new barrel that is charred and they light a fire inside of the barrel. And as I said, char an oak as well white oak has to be oak okay i don't think they say white oak it's just oak so you gotta just oak you gotta fell a tree and cut a barrel and then you char and the in the four you said are the four like four was the highest number of charring like there's char i think you could i've never heard of anyone using char five i think once you get past char five then the barrel will probably fall apart like because you're lighting a fire inside of the barrel so Char one, char two, char three, char four. Each one is a thickness of, okay. you know, like I think char four is a quarter inch thick of char, char. into the barrel. Like if you saw a, a cross section. Okay. And the fact that the barrel's new and the fact that it um, has been charred is just going to give it a lot of sweetness. Yeah. Okay. Right. As opposed to a used barrel. The other factor is it has to be 51% corn in the mm-hmm. mash bill, which are the mix of grains that you use when yeah. you make your distillate. So you 51% use, exactly or 51% or no, more? 51 minimum. Minimum. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So you can use 75 corn, like our mash bill is 75% corn, 15% rye and 10% barley. But okay. someone else could be like, we're going to use 60% corn and okay. 20% barley and 20% rye. And someone else could say, we're going to use 60% corn and 30% wheat and 10% barley. Okay. Like you can, as long as you're using three grains and as long as bourbon is, or corn, sorry, corn is 51% of it, then you can call it bourbon. Okay. Got it. 
God. And as long as it's made in America, right? So you could do that in Colorado or North Carolina or wherever you want. Okay. So, so you guys bought you bought yes. these barrels. Yes. Yeah. And then we were just like, we want to hang out in Kentucky. Like Jay had spent a lot of time there. I had spent some time there, but we're just like, we're going to visit distilleries and just, you know, kind of soak up the magic, you know, and just learn more about it. And, you know, but I guess to step back for one sec, right. The, the main thing in terms of my approach was in terms of what we were going to do differently is typically all bourbon is made as a homogenous flavor profile. So a distillery decides, you know, maybe they'll have a series of SKUs. They decide this is what it tastes like. And their goal is to replicate that, right? There's nothing wrong with that. And a lot of people make really good whiskey that way. What seemed really interesting to me and also the thing I was curious about was why can't you make it like wine where you look at your mature barrels like you would your harvest of grapes and each year you make the best thing you can. And there's mm. variation from one vintage to the next. And so okay. that's really still the unique selling proposition, I guess, to use a business term of Penhawk is we make vintages and I blend the best thing I can. And so if you were to buy bottles of Pinhook from let's say the same expression, like we make our our most popular bourbon is the orange wax, which is our, we call it our flagship bourbon or our everyday bourbon. If you were to taste that six different vintages of it, you would, and you really wanted to dig in and taste them side by side, you'd see that they actually taste quite a bit different from each other. So we're kind of, and, and it goes back to what you were saying, right? Each barrel, the standard barrel is 53 gallons. It's made from wood. No two trees are exactly the same. And so imagine each one of these 53 gallon barrels, which typically are coming from different trees. It could be the same type of tree, but it's not the actual same tree. Water's evaporating from the barrel, depending on the temperature. Alcohol's evaporating from the barrel. Oxygen's getting into the barrel. Each one is its own little chemistry set mm -hmm. or you know unique aging environment and so barrels that were filled with the exact same distillate like the same distillation run mm -hmm. can all taste really different from each other and so typically what's happening is if you think of it like a jigsaw puzzle where you're like okay the the, th the barrels i'm dumping for this batch are not the same barrels i have from the last batch because the last batch of barrels are empty I need to figure out how to taste, make the next batch taste like the prior batch. Mm. And then what the, most of the brands are doing is basically doing that forever. Like that process never ends. And they work really hard to come up with a formula for how you do that consistent taste profile. And it's really the way I always explain it to people. It's really just philosophy, right? I don't ever make the claim we do it this way and therefore our product tastes better than other people's. My point of view is more like, I just thought it would be really interesting to do it the opposite way yeah, and to make it more of a natural expression of the variety and variability that you find in whiskey. And so using it as an opportunity to express the uniqueness that exists in barrels, as opposed to just replicating the same taste over and over and over again and so i think if people are into pinhook that's what's appealing to them it's like oh i think it's really cool that you guys are just trying to make the best thing you can every year and that there is no you don't go into it already knowing what it's going to taste like how do you let you just let the best thing come together how do you educate your consumers about that i mean I, i'm because it's the hard. because the industry does it a certain Generally, I mean, maybe there's others that do it like you. I don't know. But I mean, generally it's, I like whatever it is. I don't know, Buffalo Trace. So every Buffalo Trace bottle from every year from is going to taste pretty much exactly the same. And that's what I expect. I have a level of expectation. It's always going to taste the same. How do you, how do you all, how do you share that story and tell that story and educate the consumer? It's a good question. Of your philosophy. Yeah. So, because it's really cool, but it seems like it'd be hard to, um, create that to, to tell that story at scale. So the good news is 
and I say this very respectfully, most people don't really taste anything that critically, right? Like, no, no, you're, you're exactly like, I, I don't, I wouldn't notice. I wouldn't notice if one bottle of any kind was different maybe, but I think right. that this, but what you just told me makes what you do very interesting to me as somebody who doesn't have that, that palate that would notice yes. it. But now I'm like, well, see, that's cool. Cause that's a different story. And that's something unique that this cool brand Pinhook's doing. So I'm kind of interested. And now maybe I even want to actually taste different bottles. Cause I want to see if I can even taste the different, yeah. like that's really freaking cool. Yeah, so um, here's, the, here's the tough part. So the one reality of it, right, is you don't as much have to worry about the uh, fact that someone might be not like the idea of it tasting different because we do make significant changes to our label each year, including putting a vintage date on it and putting a different geometric pattern on it inspired by Jackie's Filk. So if you looked at six different vintages of our orange wax, you would mm, see your flagship our six different vintages of our flagship. You would see six different horses because every year there's a new active racing thoroughbred on the bottle. Okay. You would see okay. six different shapes and you'd see a different vintage date. However, I think with that product just sitting on the shelf and no one explaining it to them, I think people would probably just are used to grabbing the orange and maybe aren't even noticing that there's some sort of difference in, in the label. And, and then because of what I said, they're unlikely to taste the difference also because they're unlikely to bring them home and taste two side by side with, I'm going to compare these two next to each other. But that said, to your point, it is the thing that makes us unique. So from the standpoint of the shelf, I mean, we have a QR code, we do put the vintage on it. Like we're trying to signal all these things that might make people curious about, oh, I bought this bottle. It looks different than last time. Let me learn more. Obviously, if you go to our website, you get all that information. But the rest of it is just the ongoing, well, doing a podcast, um, doing consumer tastings, doing in-store tastings, doing whiskey dinners, um, trying to tell that story on, you know, through social media. Um, and yeah, I would say, the best thing about Pinhook is also the worst thing about Pinhook. I mean, the the more you dig in, the more nuanced it is, and the more layers there are to the story. Um, but it also takes time mm. to tell it. You know, it's like, I mean, the easy part yeah. of the story to, is to tell just to say like, hey, we don't replicate a flavor profile. Every year we just make the best whiskey we can. But then you get into, well, why is it called Pinhook? And what's the deal with the horses? And so on and so forth and um so going back to the the story what ended up happening was jay's best friend from high school this guy jamie hill grew up in thoroughbred horse racing lives in lexington kentucky ended up being in thoroughbred horse racing himself and we would always stay at jamie's house when we went to just hang out and so he just started showing us his world right and that wasn't because we had some intent of connecting the two we actually originally had a bunch of different ideas around you know well we're we want to make the best thing we can each year you know essentially making an annual vintage as you would with wine but like how do you what is that what do you call that what does that look like etc cetera, etc cetera. and what we just started seeing is there are all these natural parallels between bourbon and thoroughbred horse racing and bourbon and so one was we learned that jamie a big part of his um what he does in thoroughbred horse racing is called pin hooking. And in thoroughbred horse racing, a pin hook is when you buy a baby thoroughbred based on its lineage to hopefully sell it for a profit when it's mature. So you're buying something young, hoping to sell it for a profit when it's mature. And that's a pin hook. As I've later learned, meaning all sorts of people, there are a bunch of other industries that use the term pin hook. It's a tobacco industry term. I literally heard for the first time I was in Tennessee and someone's like, oh, that's not a pin hook. What a pin hook is, is when you buy a steer and then you try to sell the steer for more than you paid for it. And then I met someone in the logging industry who's like, I'd never heard of pin hooking horses. And I certainly, and I haven't heard of pin hook bourbon, but we talk about, we'll cut down a tree and instead of turning it into lumber, we'll try to flip it to another young lumber yard for a profit. And that's called a pin hook. So anyway, the dots we connected is no one had ever made a bourbon called pin hook. And so we're like, we're pin hooking bourbon. We're buying something immature, like a young bourbon, mm -hmm. to smell it when it's older. The other part that was really important about that was 
we were doing that at a time where it was really atypical to be transparent about the fact that you did not have a distillery. And I always thought that was silly. And we were really focused on another big part of Penhook, which is, again, not something that's as much like consumer facing, was this idea of pure transparency, which is to say there's absolutely, we will tell you literally anything you want to know. There are no secrets. Like, I can't tell you that. can't tell you this. And so we also love the idea that we were building into our name the idea that we were telling people in our name well, I mean, we'd have to explain the name first, but telling them that like, we're not distillers. We don't want to distill. No one's science minded, you know, like it's not what we're interested in doing. We don't want to, we're not chemical engineers. Like we, we just want to be responsible for, it would be like, I want to be a great chef. It doesn't mean I want to like raise uh, cattle or grow vegetables necessarily. It's like, I don't necessarily want to have a farm. I just want like bring me the beef and then I'll butcher it or better yet, bring it to me butchered and I'll make the best thing I can um so that was a big part of it jamie also has a racing stable called bourbon lane stable that stable already existed and he names all of the horses in his stable with bourbon in the name of the horse and he was just doing that because he thought it was good marketing he's like well if you're anywhere in the world and you see a horse racing and it says there's bourbon in the name and so just to give you an idea like our first releases the first pen hook releases which were all connected to different thoroughbreds there was bourbon courage bourbon eyes that's all one word i-z-e hashtag bourbon urban bourbon bent on bourbon bourbon empire bourbon resolution like these are all actual horses some actual horses were successful some not so much um and so the idea that we came to jamie with was to say because horses like bourbon are about this idea of lineage like where did this come from but just because you know the lineage of a horse doesn't mean it's going to be successful, right? There's like an element of luck. And just because you know where a bourbon was made, it doesn't mean that that barrel or the way it comes together will be great. In order to reinforce the idea of that and also just uniqueness that our whiskey doesn't always taste the same. And horses are these unique animals with personalities and our whiskeys have personalities, you know, the personality of the way it tastes. We asked Jamie, would you pick an unproven thoroughbred every year and that thoroughbred goes on our label mm. and that and part of the fun of that was maker's mark does a commemorative bottling for the derby winner or like a triple crown winner but it's like the horse was already a winner and then doing the bottling after the fact is more like doing something commemorative we were like how cool would it be to connect our whiskey to actual thoroughbreds have, who are yet to prove that they're actually good thoroughbreds but that you could actually go to the track and watch them race and place a bet on them or you could watch them on tv and place a bet on them and it was really because we were having a lot of fun times at keeneland which is the track in lexington and so really making it experiential in a way um the other thing that was really interesting to us and i think you'll find this interesting as a marketing person was most of what we'd seen in the world of bourbon is it's it's a story like there's a story but the story is over like nothing will ever happen ever again it's like this whiskey is called old overholt and it's named after the so-and-so this is called jim yep. beam and jim beam is the was the first generation of the beam family who came from blah 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 but then like it doesn't go anywhere like the story already happened and so and a lot of credit to to Charles and Jay's a good marketing person as well, was the idea that we have a story that never ends. Yeah. Like the whiskey is always evolving. Yeah. The horses on the whiskey are always different. Maybe yeah. one day one of these horses will be a champion, maybe not. But that it just, it's constantly changing. It doesn't ever stop. And that was the part that was really exciting to us and still is, is that it doesn't have like... I mean, it, every year it will taste different and every year there will be a different horse. Um, and hopefully, and I think this is kind of goes back to the restaurant thing. Um, you're trying to make an emotional connection in some yeah. way. And the emotional connection that you get with wine that you typically don't get with bourbon is the idea that something won't exist again. 
and I don't mean just in the sense of it being, um, it's not about it being, uh, you know, limited or scarce. It's just the fact that that thing was only made one time. Maybe it was made in large quantities, but it will never exist again. Like once it's gone, it's gone. And I think that's part of the appeal of wine. It's like you go on your honeymoon to Sonoma and you go to this really cool winery and you buy these bottles, and then you drink them over the course of a couple few years. And then once those bottles are gone, they can never be replaced. And there's, I think the way you feel connected to something that you know there's a finite amount of is very different than you're like, oh, then I can just go back to the store whenever I want and buy another bottle of Maker's Mark, right? I mean, it will always be there and it will always taste the same. Um, and so I think we were trying to get to something around and, and that's where what Charles did so well with the different geometric shapes is like, they're easily identifiable. Like if you had a bunch of even one expression, again, like the flagship, they all look different from each other. And then you could look at that bottle and be like, oh, I've only got, you know, a third of a bottle left of 2023. And it was one of my favorites of all time. You know, it's like that relationship yeah. to the product I think is to me is, is going to be very different than a, if it's, you can always find it or B, even if it was like some super limited thing and they only made 800 bottles, that's different. That's a different thing to me. That's like scarcity. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah right. right. That's supply and demand. Yeah. That's supply and demand, but this is different. This is more like this one felt special to me for some reason. Like I, I felt I just really liked it, or there was something about the bottle, or I thought the name of the horse was really cool. Or you get connected and, with a horse, yeah, yeah, right. and that that that's so that's the part to me that always makes me feel like I'm still in the hospitality business. Is I'm really thinking about um, the experiential side of it. Man, not just the production, because yeah. I don't think we're not. Yeah. That's where we really differentiate ourselves. And we're not the only, I mean, we're not the only people that don't have a distillery, but we're not really, I think if you're in production then everything is like, we get our grain from here and our still is this type of still. And, you know, it's really focused on like, you're a manufacturer. Mm. And I don't think we're manufacturers. I think we're trying to tell a story through whiskey, which ultimately also needs to taste good. Mm, the, yeah, you know, the, the opportunity you give to people that run bourbon clubs or b- bartenders that have, you know, a stout bourbon collection or a whiskey collection. I mean, that's, that's really cool because you give them, Hey, let me, you know, somebody that's really interested. That's a super interesting story. If it's just somebody that's just coming in and really doesn't care, just give me a bourbon. I don't care. Okay, yep. fine. But many, many people are very dialed into bourbon and they attach themselves to a brand or some brands or they have some reason they like some some bourbon. But yours, that's just such a unique thing. I mean, this is this is like, uh, yeah, it's at the ongoing. It's like you you become part of the story almost. Like I'm 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 you know I got my first bottle this year with this yep. horse and wait till the year one of your horses wins Belmont or something like that. Well, that's the thing, right? I mean, (laughs) and that was the other area that we really wanted to be authentic to is like, you know, we always try to give Jamie a lot of grief. Like, well, come on, dude, where's our, uh, where's our, you know, big champion thoroughbred. And he's always, there are 25,000 bulls born in Kentucky each year. There are 20 spots in the Kentucky Derby. Like it's similar to sports, right? I mean, you know, being a division one college football player is already really really short odds and then the odds of going from d1 to being an nfl player are right i mean it's like it's tiny tiny right so it's similar with the horses but it would be i mean it would be even that much more exciting if one of them you know and some of them like actually the the horse on our current flagship is a horse named bourbon resolve Bourbon Resolve ran second to Mage, who won the Kentucky Derby in a couple of races this year, but in the end didn't perform well enough in enough races to get enough points to even become close to going to the Kentucky Derby. But like, they're in the mix, right? I mean, he's yeah. he was racing against the Derby winner and performing well. So, you know, it's hopefully just a matter of time. Um, 
but man, if, even if it took 20 years, like how sweet would that be if one day there's like all these years later, you know, you finally have that horse and it's in the Derby. And then, well, I mean, what if it actually won? Um, it would be pretty slim odds, but. Yeah. But even, even this, and look, you've got, so I'm interested now and in just, okay, I want to get a bottle and, and figure out, okay, so here's the horse's name. Like, yeah. Well, let me start following that horse. You're, you're marrying, you know, I mean, because these things are married together in a lot of ways anyway, Kentucky and bourbon and horse racing or whatever, but then you probably get people that don't pay attention to or barely pay attention to horse yeah. racing, or maybe they watch the Derby every year that now have some reason to kind of follow it and get engaged. And, you know, you're you're kind of betting. I mean, there's all, there's all this betting in horse racing. You're kind of starting to bet on your, like, I, you know, I know who I'm cheering for in this race where otherwise it was like, I mean, we sit down every year. We, my fan, we watch the Kentucky, we just literally pick a name like, Oh, that's a cool name. Like it'd be of cool course. in any race or whatever to start like, Oh, I, that, that, that's my horse. Like, I, you know, I have some connection to that horse. Um, so you're not, okay. So you're not distilling, not distilling. you're buying and you are, um, telling, uh, creating a, a certain amount that you're, you go sell every year and you did how, how many barrels last year you said, or this year? Last year we dumped 1200 barrels, 1200 barrels. Okay. Yeah. Which again, I mean, just to create some context, I bet the big guys dump in a thousand barrel batches and they probably have to do like, I'm just, I use maker's mark cause everyone knows it like, and cause it's like a small batch whiskey where it's sort of presented as being craft. They probably have to dump, a thousand barrels three times a week three times a week yeah i would think so okay i mean it's so 150,000 160,000 whatever a year yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's a lot yeah yeah uh, so what we do is not we're not teeny tiny but you know it's small mhm mm no for sure um and your i mean i know we talked before you had gotten into whatever it was, some X number of states, 20 something states or whatever, but mm -hmm. you were getting a little bit more focused on certain ones. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's a learning process. I think the easiest way to grow is to just go into new markets, but then to what you and I were talking about, if you, you have to educate and if the education is has to be spread out over that many states it would take you an awful lot of people and your distributor is not really going to do much of that education it really falls on you as the brand so i think it's the thing it took us a long time to figure out even though i guess you could say it's pretty simple is like i think we asked the question for a long time and it took us a while the question is should you go deeper or go wider right and i think in the end we figured out you need to go deeper because you can jump into a new market, get people really excited, have an initial pop, and then get it into what in the industry we would call like you fill the pipeline, like you get it on the shelves. But in order to be successful, it has to come off the shelf or what they call pull through or sell through, and then it has to be replenished. And unless you're unless you have a lot of recognition, name recognition, the pull through is hard. Or mm you might get the initial pull through and it's not that um, it's not that people didn't like the product, but they have so many other choices. So you don't get the second bottle sale. And so maybe it does like the pipelines filled, the shelves are somewhat cleared, the shelves get replenished, but then getting the next round of pull would mean that you'd have to introduce it to more consumers and the beauty or the maddening part of this industry, depending on your perspective, and you kind of have to embrace the grind of it is that there's, you know, I mean, in the, except for the extreme rare cases of like George Clooney with Casamigos or something like that, there's no magic bullet. It's literally, it's one bottle at a time, one account at a time, one person at a time. You just have to, you just have to go around, tell the story. And it's not like you could just do one move and then all of a sudden, like, it's all these magical things are going to happen. Like you, you, you go out every day and that's the part that it reminds me of, of a restaurant. It's like a restaurant is the ultimate. And I don't mean grind in the negative sense. No, I mean, it's just that 
it's, it's not going to go on, onto autopilot. You got to keep, yeah, keep cranking it, it every day. It doesn't run itself. You, you, you get up and you just do some version of the same thing over and yep. over and over again. Um, and I mean, with restaurants, I would always say it's like you could have the best night in the restaurant that it's ever had in terms of like the quality of the service, maybe your revenue, you know, the timing of the kitchen, all these types of things. And you wake up the next day and you're right back at zero. Yeah. Yep. Right. It's a new day, mostly different people coming into the restaurant and you don't really get to take anything from the night before, except for like, Hey, well, that was a great night. You know, maybe you can try to, you know, reinforce good habits and figure out why, why things went so well, but on balance, you're just starting again at zero and same thing too. you you can work really hard to get a, an account, like let's say a retail shop, an independent retail shop. And there could be someone and it could be a relationship that you build and they love pin hook. And then the person who's the buyer decides that they're, they leave the store and maybe they even leave the industry. And now there's a new buyer and you don't know that new buyer. And so then, you know, the, the cliche of this industry is that it's a relationships business. It's just all the relationships you have with your distributor, with your consumers and with the, um, um, with your distributor. You know, um, with very, very few exceptions, overnight successes, and this is in almost any industry in any kind of business, overnight successes happened for decades before they were an overnight success, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, the whole hockey stick growth thing, I have a, a buddy who wrote a book uh, called The Hockey Stick Principles, and he just talks yeah. about, like, before you hit that that nonlinear growth where it really starts to accelerate and you're going up the, yeah. Yeah. the shaft, you, you have the yeah. blade years as he calls them. Yeah. The blade years are just, you don't know when the blade years are going to end and you're going to, and this stuff's going to start to kind of build on itself and the momentum is yeah. so big, but the blade years can be long and that's where most people drop off because you don't see that, you know, one plus one equals three right away. One plus one might equal two and sometimes not even that early on. And it's just a matter of just, continuing to, like you said, wake up every day. I mean, we've been doing it for 16 years at schedule fly. You yeah. know, we wake up every day, we tell the same story, we do the same thing. And, and then just little by little over time you, you make, I mean, just this relationship, right? Like, you know, you find new people that have a similar ethos and share interests and contacts. And somehow those things, you know, somehow serendipitously seem to lead to good things. And you just have to have enough of that, but you have to do it long enough and just stick mm -hmm. with it long enough. And that's hard to do. That's hard to do in your business. It's hard to do in ours. It's hard. I mean, it, it really is. Um, but that tends to be the differentiator, um, in a world like yours or, or ours and, and you're, um, you know, you guys are, I'm glad you're going instead of the short of the shallow and wide that the narrow and deep, um, I think that's really smart. There's the, the best business advice I ever got. In my previous business was, uh, focus, 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 dominate, dominate, dominate. And, um, that was again, a totally different yeah. industry, but it helped us realize like we were trying to sell this, this content we had to like anybody and everybody. And we're like, no, 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 no. Like the, this is the audience we should focus on. And like, let's just crush it with that audience. And then if we do that, then we can try another, another audience where yours is more geographically, maybe like, let's F and kill it in New York or yep. Louisiana, whatever the states are, North Carolina, and just dominate there because then that stuff starts to things happen spring from that, you know, that, that you can't even account for. I mean, look at um the largest American uh brewery, American owned brewery, is Yingling. And Yingling's Pottsville, Pennsylvania, they're only on the East Coast. But they're the yeah. you know, because they're all the other ones sold out to overseas, but you know, they're they're like, dude, we're not going like west yet because we still got to like we still got room to grow on the east coast, and we all know Yingling here. But you go to California, they're like, oh, I've heard of Yingling, I can't get that here, and you kind of want it, so you want to, you know. And then you go to, like, it seems like that's a cool way that they've grown that, and you know, that's a massive, you know, huge uh, brand now, but it's only on the east coast. Yeah, we really started in like New York, New Jersey, Kentucky. Louisiana and mid Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. It's, I mean, it's, uh, 
this isn't quite right, but I would probably now almost say like, we should probably still just be in those markets. Yeah. Because it's just like every market you go into, it's like, it takes time and attention away from somewhere else. And when you're small, mm -hmm. there are only so many people, so many resources, both people and dollars. And you, you know, you, you're focusing less on this thing to focus on this other thing. And then, to your point about yingling, it's like you were not even close to where you could be right? in the place you already are. And then you already go somewhere new and then you're sacrificing the momentum that you were building originally. And then it's hard to go back and like get it kickstarted again. You know what I'm saying? So, um, it's a good, it's a good lesson, but I don't know, like you said, you're going to make lots of mistakes and, some of the mistakes we could we we made you can be forgiven for making because the distributor's calling you and being like we're gonna crush it like we will sell right, right. 1700 cases in our first year yeah. people are you know everyone's clamoring for pin hook please 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 and yeah, it's hard not to feel flattered by that and also like yeah we're gonna sell more um but then that's a market you need to visit and train people and do consumer tastings. And there are only so many hours in the day. And when you're small, like I was saying, only so many people. Um, and then you're spread too thin is probably the simplest way of thinking about it. And as you get spread thin, the place you'd spend all this time building momentum and energy, you're kind of taking away from that, you know, you're, um, you're, yeah, man, it's that's a, it's tough to say no. It's I mean, really particularly when you, no. particularly when you come from hospitality, that's like you know you try to find a way to say yes, like make things happen. And uh, yeah, but y'all are man, I love what I I love what I see with what y'all are doing, man. And you you are learning and and uh, getting better each each time I talk to you. And um, I think I mean you've got some markets that. You know, like where are there really good independent restaurants? And you know, obviously New York and Louisiana, and yep, there are a lot in Kentucky too. There's a lot of good food there. I know you're in Colorado. I mean, Colorado. God, man, I can't say enough about all the freaking independent restaurants out in Colorado, which is really where like they tell good stories. They get it. They understand um, uh, what something like your brand means and. I don't know why it is in just certain states where you find certain types of people and then they probably sell to a consumer that's interested in something like that too. But, um, well, look, okay. I've got, let's see here. So I'm talking to Neil in 30 minutes, I believe. Yep. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. He's a buddy of yours, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's the best. What do I need to know about him? Um, what should I ask him about? It's a good question. Like something yeah. random. Well, you know, to be honest, he, well, you know, it's funny. Um, well, he worked for the same restaurant group that I did in New York, a oh, restaurant really? group called Be Our Guest. Be Our um, Guest. Yeah, but he has another fun, I was talking to him about it not too long ago, and I don't remember all the details, but he had another one of those fun, like, you know, things going, you know, just like a little bit lost at sea, kind of like I was, yeah. and then somehow you know, finding, finding his way. But I think he really brought cocktails to, um, I mean, he really, I mean, this has always been like an epicenter of cocktails, but I cure is really, I think they really put New Orleans on the map in terms of the modern cocktail scene, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's, you'll, you'll love him. He's, he's such a good guy. Well, so I got to get down there. Um, maybe I'll get down to the spring and I'll bring my bride. Yeah. And we'll hang for a couple of days. I, I was going to stay that. at, um, I was going to stay at Dave and Dana's, uh, house. They offered that. Oh, up. Nice. I don't, and, um, yeah. I do want to get down there cause I want to meet Neil in person. I want, I don't know if you're going to be over there in your, you know, Dave Nitza was there. I think y'all met at the tales of the cocktail thing. Yeah. Um, I met him briefly. Yeah. He's got a book called, uh, hospitality DNA that um i highly recommend um phenomenal book neil was in it that's how they got to know each other oh, and nice. um and then i gotta get we gotta get you uh you got some socks 
I got my schedule fly socks. I saw that, dude. Look at that. We got matching socks, man. <laughs> Do you see yeah, I had mine on? Yeah. Oh, man. Well, I love it. Those things are cool. They're comfortable. They're super comfortable. I love them. I love your hat. You know, your hat, it's funny. Your hat reminds me of uh, the, um, like, it looks It looks a lot like a cricket hat, which is ironic because we got to get you and Hobson talking cricket. I think you nailed you it. I think that'd be a great brand for y'all to affiliate with. You know, it's funny. I, I bought this hat from Huckberry and it was like a Coors hat. And I took the patch off of it and put a pin. Cause sometimes and you put the pin. Yeah. yeah. Cause a friend of mine who's in the industry, like he makes apparel. He's just like, all the good stuff goes to the brands. You know what I mean? Like, uh-huh. like you can't get, um, like you can't get, um, like this hat. Like I figured it out. It's like, it's not like some company like, uh, like Richardson, like it doesn't yeah. have a name on it. Like it was manufactured. It's like Patagonia hats. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. It I tried manu- to get Patagonia to tell me where they made their hats, and they're like, uh-uh. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, You're like, your nope. hats are awesome. Your hats are yeah, they awesome. have the perfect like, fit and everything. Yeah. All right, I got to run to this uh, tasting. Yeah. Um, that was awesome. That was fun, man. That was that really was fun, fun for sure. Well, how well you um. Do? But yeah, let's. You come, we need to get you down here. I want to get down there. We'll probably come in the spring and um, hang out for a few days. And then if you're ever, you know, next time you're coming up towards Charlotte or Raleigh or something, let me know. We'll hang. Okay. Awesome. Bye, right, man. All right, brother. See you, brother. Take care of yourself. Appreciate it. Right, bye. All right, later.